Welcome to the first part of lecture nine on Feynman or parametric integration. This one is titled differentiating under the integral sign powers and Gaussians. So among his many achievements, Richard Feynman was well known for being someone who was able to solve many integrals that no one else could solve. And one of the tools that he had in his bag of tricks was a method that is now called parametric integration. And it involves effectively switching the order of integration and differentiation. And if you are a mathematical type, you need to know that that's going to only hold if the functions are properly behaved. But the basic method is pretty simple. It says if I take a function that depends on x and some parameter alpha, and I want the derivative of the integral of that function differentiated with respect to the parameter alpha, I can switch the order and bring the derivative inside the integration sign and take a partial derivative of f with respect to the parameter alpha before I do the integral. So I can either do the derivatives before I do the integral, or I can do the derivative after I do the integral. And that is essentially the mathematical method behind parametric integration or Feynman integration. But the key is you have to figure out how to introduce this parameter alpha, and that requires a lot of cleverness. And the only way to really show you how to do this is by showing you some examples. So we're going to spend the rest of our time going through a number of different examples that show precisely how this works. I want to take a short moment, though, to comment that this method called Feynman integration has nothing to do with the other method of Feynman that you might have heard called path integrals. Path integrals are a very different thing, and they're used to solve quantum mechanics problems. They're very different from what we're talking about here, which is just a method, a very clever method, for solving integrals. Okay, let's look at our first example. We want to find the integral dx of x to the n e to the minus x squared. This is an integral that occurs many, many different times in physics. You're going to encounter it many times in your career, and it's useful to see how exactly do you solve such an integral, even though you can just look it up or plug it into Wolfram alpha and so forth. Understanding where it comes from is, I think, quite important, once again, in making this transition from a technician to a practitioner. So let's recall, we already determined what the integral of a Gaussian is. It's equal to the square root of pi, and we got that by squaring the integral and then writing it as a two-dimensional integral and converting to polar coordinates and so forth and so forth. Now, if you look carefully, you can see that that integrand is an even function. Since it's an even function, the integral from zero to infinity or over just the positive numbers is going to be one half the, the total integral. And so we immediately learn the integral from 0 to infinity dx e to the minus x squared is equal to the square root of pi over 2 and that corresponds to the case n equals 0. And so we have one of our results already. We now want to look at the results for the other powers. It turns out that the case with odd powers is easier to work out than the case with even powers. So let's first consider the case where the power is odd. So n is equal to 2m plus 1 with m an integer and we're going to first use our inverse chain rule and let u equals x squared, which means du is equal to 2x dx. And we're going to substitute that in and change the variables in the integration from u to x. We find our integral becomes 1 half, the integral from 0 to infinity du, u to the m, e to the minus u. This looks like something that might be easier to integrate than something that goes like e to the minus x squared, and indeed it is. But we still have to figure out how do we put in the parameter. And so we need to be clever in order to use the Feynman method and the strategy for putting the parameter in is to put it into the exponent of the exponential. When we do that we can then replace powers that appear in the integrand by derivatives with respect to alpha. I think you need to see the equation to fully appreciate this so let's see exactly how this works. So we start off with this integral with respect to u and we introduce the parameter alpha. We're going to have to set alpha equals 1 for it to equal the integral that we are interested in. And now look at that exponential. If I take a derivative with respect to alpha, I'm going to pull out a factor of minus u. And so if I want u to the m, I've got to repeat that derivative m times. But I'm going to pull out a factor of minus 1 to the m times u to the m. I've got to get rid of that factor of minus 1 to the m. The easiest way of doing that is multiplying by minus 1 to the m because minus 1 squared is equal to 1. So we find our original integral with the powers is just 1 half minus 1 to the m, the mth derivative with respect to alpha, 
of e to the minus alpha u evaluated at alpha equals 1. And if you look carefully, I have already taken that derivative, all of those m derivatives, from inside the integral to outside the integral. So we evaluated them inside the integral to convert the u to the m e to the minus u into something that we can directly integrate. And then we pulled them out of the integrals because we're going to do the integral first, get a function of alpha, then take the derivative with respect to alpha, and only at the end set alpha equal to 1. Okay, how does it work? Well, the integral is straightforward. It's minus 1 over alpha e to the minus alpha u. I have to evaluate that between 0 and infinity. When I substitute in infinity, I get e to the minus infinity, and that's, of course, 0. When I substitute in 0, e to the minus 0 is equal to 1. And so the integral just equals 1 over alpha. I now have to take the derivative before I set alpha equals 1. That's very important to remember that. If I set alpha equal to 1 first, I'm going to get the wrong answer. So I have to take the derivative first, and then only at the end do I set alpha equals 1. So I have the derivative of 1 over alpha. Well, if I take the derivative of 1 over alpha, I'll get minus 1 over alpha squared. If I take the derivative of 1 over alpha squared, I get minus 1 over alpha cubed. Take the derivative of 1 over alpha cubed, I get minus 1 over, I'm sorry, minus 3 over alpha to the fourth. Every time I take a derivative, I'm going to get a minus sign, but I'm also get, going to get an integer equal to whatever that power is in the denominator that's multiplying it. So the minus 1 raised to the nth power is going to cancel with that minus 1 to the m that's sitting in front of it. And I'll just be left with the product of the integers, 1 times 2 times 3 all the way out to m. That's, of course, equal to m factorial. So we have now solved the problem for odd powers. The integral is equal to 1 half m factorial. All right, let's move on to even powers. Now we are going to take n equals 2m. We're going to once again add alpha into the exponent. But we're not going to do a change of variables because we can directly get the power by taking derivatives here. So once again, I'm going to have to take m derivatives. Every time I take a derivative with respect to alpha, I pull out a factor of minus x squared. So I've got to cancel that minus 1 to the m once again. And then I'm going to pull the integral out from underneath the integral sign into an, a derivative that I'm going to be doing after I've evaluated the integral. So I now have m derivatives with respect to alpha of this integral e to the minus alpha x squared evaluated at alpha equals 1. Okay, now we use the inverse chain rule or substitution. I'm going to let u equal square root of alpha x so that du is equal to square root of alpha dx. And if we recall the value of the Gaussian integral from 0 to infinity is just square root of pi over 2, we can immediately write out what this is. I have the minus 1 to the m, the mth derivative with respect to alpha. The integral is equal to 1 half square root of pi over alpha. Okay, so I have 1 over alpha to the 1 half. Now when I take the derivative, I get a minus 1 half alpha to the minus 3 halves. When I take that derivative, I get a minus 3 halves alpha to the minus 5 halves, and so forth. Every time I take a derivative, I get a half odd integer and a factor of minus 1. So the minus 1 to the m's are going to cancel again. I don't have to worry about the minus signs. And I now have this product 1 half times 3 halves times 5 halves all the way out to 2m minus 1 divided by 2. Now if we go back we can write that in a uniform form. I have all these powers of 2 in the denominator. I can count them up. There are m powers associated with the m derivatives but I had a one power of 2 already in the integral itself, so the total is 2 to the m plus 1. I have the square root of pi, which I have to keep with me, and then the numerator is, once again, the product of all the odd integers up to 2m minus 1. That is just this result that we call 2m minus 1 factorial factorial, or 2m minus 1 double factorial. So now, to summarize, we've evaluated these integrals in these two cases, with the even and the odd powers, and now I'm converting it in terms of n, instead of writing it in terms of the integer m. When we have an odd integer, it becomes just 1 half the appropriate integer factorial. When we have even n, we have this double factorial, and we have these powers of 2 that we have to take into account as well, and in addition, a factor of square root of pi. OK, so that gives us what these integrals are for the powers multiplied by Gaussians. And that's going to be the end of the first part of this lecture.